Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final day of Glasgow Science Centre's Curious About Our Planet Digital Science Festival. My name is Jess, and today I'm really excited to be joined by Kath Lawson, the Regional Manager for Africa at WWF UK. She'll be doing a presentation, and after that, uh, we'll be opening up the live Q&A for any questions that you might have about her experience or her journey. And you can ask those questions in the YouTube comments on the right hand side. Hopefully we'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. So make sure that you have a good think about them uh, while we go to this presentation. But without any further ado, I will pass it over to Kath now. My name is Kath Lawson and I'm a Regional Manager for Africa at WWF UK. The polar bear is arguably, albeit undesirably, the poster child of climate change. But the impacts of climate change aren't limited to those species that are found in the polar regions. In my work at WWF, I support conservation programmes primarily in East Africa, and I wanted to take this opportunity to explain some of the current and potential impacts of climate change on some African species, including marine turtles, mountain gorillas, and African elephants. There are seven species of marine turtle and five of those are known to inhabit the waters of Africa and nest on African beaches. For more than a hundred million years, Marine turtles have covered vast different distances across the world's oceans and have performed vital and integral roles in marine and coastal ecosystems. But a changing climate and global warming have the potential to seriously impact marine turtle populations. Perhaps one of the most surprising impacts relates to the fact that the temperature of the sand in which marine turtle eggs incubate influences the sex of the turtle that hatches. Typically, males come from lower, cooler parts of the nest and warmer temperatures of 29.1 degrees Celsius and above produce females. Increasing temperatures means more females are likely to be born. And sadly, this isn't just a hypothetical problem. We're already seeing these impacts in some marine turtle populations. For example, in green turtle populations in the northern Great Barrier Reef, offspring are born almost completely female, with males outnumbered by at least 116 to 1. If this feminization trend continues and indeed becomes more widespread, it will be detrimental to the future of this species. At a local level, we're piloting various methods to create cooler, localised sand temperatures and to help maintain a more natural sex ratio. But in the future, this might be needed at a much greater scale. Breeding could also be affected by rising sea levels. As waters warm and sea levels rise, high tide marks get higher. And in many instances, this threatens to flood what are traditional turtle nesting sites. Marine turtles have this incredible ability to return to the nests that they hatched on in order to nest themselves, even if that means traveling hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers. But if the high tide mark changes, nests can flood and hatchlings won't survive. In some areas of the world, marine turtles are already altering their migratory routes and nesting sites, but it remains to be seen how far they can do this in order to respond to the changes that are continuing to happen. In other locations where we and others have intensive nesting, nest monitoring programs, nests are being manually relocated to be in locations that are above the high tide mark. Nest relocation obviously has its own risks, and there are detailed protocols in place that have to be followed. 
but in some cases, it's the only option to avoid total loss of the nest. Beyond breeding, indirectly, climate change is likely to impact marine turtles through changes in food availability. Increases in ocean temperature can result in damage to important turtle feeding habitats, including seagrass beds and coral reefs. Again, there's already some evidence that because of rising ocean temperatures and changing sea currents, marine turtles are having to migrate further between nesting sites and feeding grounds. Sadly, the current and potential impacts of climate change aren't limited to marine species in Africa. In the high altitude montane forests of the greater Virunga landscape, we're also seeing impacts. Based on the most recent data, the global population of mountain gorillas is estimated at 1,063. Those individuals live in two isolated subpopulations, one in the Virunga Massive, which spans the borders of Uganda, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and one in the Bwindi Sarambwe ecosystem, which is primarily in Uganda. Both subpopulations are completely surrounded by human settlements and agriculture. Although the population numbers are quite low, and although the subspecies remain fragile, mountain gorillas are the only great ape known to be increasing in number, and they are typically considered to be a conservation success. That said, the threats to mountain gorilla survival persist, and climate change is a very real part of that. Mountain gorillas possess a number of traits that contribute to their resilience to a change in climate. For example, they are tolerant to a wide range of temperatures. They are already exposed to a fairly high climate variability. They have low fresh water requirements and they feed on a variety of relatively abundant food. But there are also limits to their ability to adapt. In the mountain gorillas range, the impacts of climate change are predicted to increase temperatures and to modify rain patterns. And just like for marine turtles, this will have an impact on food availability and habitat quality. Mountain gorilla habitat is, as you might expect, mountainous. And so what's likely to happen is that certain vegetation species will shift upslope in their distribution so as to match their preferred climate conditions. Given their broad diet, their behavioural flexibility and the mobility of their range, at least in terms of nesting and breeding sites, gorillas, like most primates, are likely to be able to buffer some of the effects of climate change. However, the mountainous nature of their habitat and the high human pressure in surrounding areas means that their dispersal ability is limited. To put it really simply, they don't have much ability to go up or indeed down should major changes happen to their habitat. There are also challenges from the significant impact that climate change will likely have on the human populations living near the mountain gorillas. For example, if food and water supplies for the local community are affected, such as in a drought that reduces crop yields, the already considerable pressure on the forest habitat to provide these kind of resources is likely to increase even further. In addition to the potential for habitat degradation, this, combined with the mountain gorilla's potential need to disperse further, will increase the likelihood of human-gorilla interaction. And because of our close genetic similarity, this increases the risk of disease transmission. For now, the priority is to prevent further fragmentation of mountain gorilla habitat, to strengthen connectivity of that habitat where that's possible, and to build resilience to the impacts of climate change in local human populations. Like mountain gorillas, the flexibility of certain elephant behavioural characteristics provides some resilience to the impacts of climate change. African elephants, which are found in 37 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, exist across a range of diverse habitats, including savannas, forests and deserts. 
they are exposed to a broad climate variability and they feed on a number of different foods. But unlike mountain gorillas, African elephants need large amounts of fresh water. On average, a single African elephant needs to drink a truly incredible 150 to 300 litres of water per day. In elephant ranges, it's predicted that in future, temperatures will get hotter, rainfall will decrease, and periods of severe drought will increase, all of which will have a direct effect on elephant numbers. Increased competition between individuals, and indeed with humans, combined with an increase in calf mortality in times of drought, means that populations are limited by the availability of water. And sadly, we've seen these things play out in reality. For example, severe droughts in Kenya in 2016-17 and 2008-9 resulted in more elephants dying compared to other years. Unfortunately, the increasing fragmentation of African elephant habitat limits their ability to disperse in response to changes in food and water availability. African elephants need large home ranges in order to find enough food and water. And in some cases, that's more than 30,000 kilometers square. Whilst migrating in line with shifting resources seems like the sensible option, as is the case for mountain gorillas, anthropogenic barriers like fences and roads may stop African elephants from being able to do this. Likewise, the impacts of climate change on people may mean that they need to migrate and potentially further fragment the habitat in order to adapt their own lifestyles. And so once again, the coexistence of people and wildlife becomes more complicated and more challenging as a result of climate change. And so what do we do? Climate change will inevitably affect Africa's biodiversity. In some cases, we are already seeing its impact. What's less certain at this stage, however, is how much harm it will ultimately cause. We're now really, really lucky to be joined by Kath for a live Q&A. Welcome, Kath. How are you? Morning. Good to see you. It's good to see you as well. Thank you so much for joining us um, and for our live Q&A. So anyone that's watching at the moment, start sending in your questions now. But what I want to ask you first, Kath, just to kickstart the conversation, um, how does one become a regional manager for at WWF UK? What has your career journey been like? It's a good question, a long question. <laughs> I guess when I was when I was young, when I was at school, I I knew I liked animals, but that was pretty much it. I didn't really have a clear career path in mind. Um, and I studied a really diverse range of subjects. I was studying art and psychology. Um, <clears throat> And it wasn't really until I got to university that I, I got a bit more clarity about where I was where I was heading. Uh, as an undergraduate, I studied biological anthropology, which is essentially um, the study of everything that makes us human. So it included evolutionary biology, genetics, disease. And as part of that, I studied some primatology, um, obviously part of our evolutionary history. Uh, and I did my dissertation on the Western lowland gorillas at Bristol Zoo, uh, looking at how their behavior related to, to the behavior of gorillas in the wild. And, and that got me hooked, to be honest. Uh, I went on from there to study a master's in primate conservation specifically, uh, which included a dissertation, uh, spending some time in South Africa, following a troop of baboons and learning about the, the role that they played in seed dispersal in the landscape that they lived in. And that's then when I moved into employment. And I started as an intern, as, as many people in the conservation sector do, uh, at the Zoological Society of London, which is the, the conservation arm of London Zoo. You might know it better as London mm -hmm. Zoo. And I was supporting conservation projects in Africa. 
And again, it got me very much hooked into the African landscapes. Um, and after that, I moved to work for a, a charity called Save the Rhino International, which as you might imagine, very rhino focused. Um, and it was a smaller charity, but actually it gave me a really good insight into the nuts and bolts of how conservation charity worked. And I had the opportunity to be involved in a, a huge breadth of the charity's work from the admin side of things of doing the financial accounts and fixing computers to being in Kenya and, and out with a ranger group looking for black rhino in the bush. Um, and it was just a, yeah, a, a really great breadth of how conservation works. I went back to the Zoological Society of London uh, and I, I ran a program called the Edge Fellows Program, which is um, sort of a capacity building program for early career conservationists across the world who were working on projects focused on some of the most unique and some of the most endangered species in the world. And my role was to sort of help them get those projects started and then mentor them through the process of running those projects. And then it was from there that I, I moved to WWF, based in the UK, but looking after projects primarily in East Africa. Um, and I've been there for just shy of eight years now. Um, and, and really, the whole breadth of my conservation career until I got to the point of working for WWF has really helped build my skill set to be able to do that job. And even doing the accounts at Save the Rhino, actually, still a really important part of the job that I do right now. But I, I'm obviously very lucky. I get some incredible opportunities as part of my job. I've, I've seen some beautiful wildlife in, in the wild. Um, and I work with some fantastic people all across the world who are just enormously inspiring. I was going to say that is an incredible career journey. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And it was planned. It was all just slightly <laughs> by luck. <laughs> good, good fortune. That is, it's an incredible career journey, being able to travel to South Africa to work with baboons and then being able to work with projects in Kenya um, and, and now to being regional manager looking after East African projects for mountain gorillas. I think that's, what a spectacular career that you've had. I think that's really, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um in your in the presentation that you just did, you were talking about um, marine turtles, and I was just wondering if you could talk more about those pilot programs um, that help create cooler localized sand temperatures. What does that actually involve? Sure. So it's not work I'm directly involved with. It's actually work that our office in Australia has been piloting. Um, so as I say, I'm focused in East Africa, but we have work happening in Australia that, that is potentially very relevant to the work mm -hmm. in East Africa. And essentially, we're trialling um, a series of structures that create shade in the aim to then cool the sand temperature. And we're really looking for what are very simple, very cost effective ways in which we could do this. So, so we are literally a bit like a science experiment, really. We are, <laughs> when, when turtles come to nest, we are very carefully relocating those nests. And then we are applying scientific conditions to each of those nesting sites to look at how effective different things are at creating cooler sand temperatures. So, so we'll have some nests that are left in direct sunlight, so a sort of control mm -hmm. for our experiment. Then there are some that are being uh, shaded by a man-made structure. So we've got some cloth that is creating the shade. Mm -hmm. Some that are being um, shaded by more natural materials, so leaves, leaf litter that's fallen on the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some that are being irrigated with seawater. So literally on a regular basis, someone is coming along with a watering mm -hmm. can and watering the sand where those <laughs> nesting sites are. I've seen the pictures and it looks ridiculous. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so uh, and then we're... Um, we put data loggers into those nest sites so that we can monitor mm. the temperature and, and see what's happening there. And it, I mean, it's a, it's a huge undertaking of work. We need to be able to identify when a nesting happens. So what mm. that means is that we have volunteers that are patrolling the beaches where we know turtles come to nest through the night, to be honest, because that's typically when a turtle will nest and often for the entire night. We know roughly when a turtle will come within a, a couple of days, perhaps, but then we'll have to patrol so that we can identify that that nesting occurrence and then relocate those site, them, those nests. 
And what we're then doing is when the turtles hatch, we're also monitoring their performance there. And the thinking is that those that have been in cooler nesting sites will hatch with uh, more energy. So they'll be quicker at crawling and at swimming. And if they are um, the wrong way up, they're able to turn themselves back the right way. And that's really important for their survival as well. Um, mm. Turtle hatchlings have it really tough. And the estimation is something like one in a thousand hatchlings actually makes it to, to full adulthood. And that point where they hatch to get to the sea is actually a really dangerous part of their life cycle because there are crabs on the beach or there are seabirds who think lots of tasty hatchlings to get. So the, the quicker they can get to the sea, the better it is for them. So again, there's obviously the point around uh, the, the sex ratio and the impact that the temperature will have there, but then also about the survival once they do hatch as well. That sounds like such a huge logistical and operational feat, just being able <laughs> to make sure that you've got people there on the beach to safely remove or relocate the nests, um, ensuring that all of the data is there, that you're able to observe each and every single one of those nests. I can't even imagine what that would be like to try and, and run. Um, I, I've got another question about specifically the nests with sea turtle nests. What is the process of relocating a nest? Uh, as I said, I'm sure that it's a very huge logistical and operational feat to make sure that you're able to uh, relocate it safely. So what does that process involve? Yeah, you're right. It is a logistical challenge. And, and certainly in our sites in Kenya, it's made even more logistically challenging in that these aren't sites you can drive to. You have to be on a boat to get to some of the beaches. And it's uh, mm. uh, lots of little islands that you need to travel between. And obviously then tides come into play. So the logistical challenge of all this can be can be massive. Um, and as I, I said in my presentation, there's one of the, I mean, there are many incredible things about marine turtles. They have so many weird quirks. They're, they're such a fascinating <laughs> species. Um, is that, that female turtles come back to nest on the sites where they themselves nested or, or very close to it um, but but as I highlighted there is sometimes this need to to relocate them um, and that might be because the impacts of climate change have changed the high tide mark mm -hmm. but it also might be because they're in a site that is is particularly at risk of predation so other species coming in and digging up those nests um, or indeed sadly poaching by people so if a site has has a nesting site is suddenly very close to a human settlement, that might be considered a concern. Um, but we don't relocate lightly. It, it comes with its own risks. Um, and so there is a sort of you know, cost benefit analysis that needs to be done. And if we do decide that we need to relocate that nest, it, it's done by people who are very skilled in it. Um, it's, it's a very uh, methodical process and there are very strict protocols that we have to follow. And you know, down to the point of one egg is moved at a time and it's arranged in the same pattern that it was when it was laid. Because actually there's some thinking about how that that's already important. So, so when we move the nest, we need to replicate that. And one of the other things we'll do is, is take the sand from the original nest and put that into the relocated nest. And that's because when uh, a female turtle nests, she mm. secretes this special fluid into the sand and that stops bacteria infecting the eggs. So obviously, if we moved the eggs and we didn't move that, then we potentially increase the risk around bacteria infection. So, so we literally are moving the whole nest, sand included. Um, I guess it's worth just saying that marine turtles, they don't come back to the nests. So they're not like birds where they, they lay the nests and come back and check on the eggs or, mm. you know, sit on the eggs whilst they, they hatch. Marine turtles literally dig a nest, lay their eggs, fill in the nest and then leave. Uh, and that's the involvement of, of a female turtle in its hatchlings. So, so moving the nest, although there are lots of things we need to consider, mm we don't need to worry about the fact that a, a marine turtle is going to come back and think, where's my nest gone? That's yeah. not going to happen. I think that's, that sounds insane. Um, <laughs> all I could imagine was just literally like very delicately removing the eggs and then 
<laughs> having the sand that you're just as delicately delicately moving um, to make sure that you've still got that secretion from the marine turtle. Uh, we do have a comment coming in from YouTube. So from Kieran Hughes, a uh, six-year-old Mara is asking, how many elephants are there in East Africa and what is being done to help them? Off the top of my head, I can't give you the East African fact. Across Africa, it's something like, it's just over 300,000 elephants, they record, I believe, on the latest census. It's a bit of a mishmash of data because different mm -hmm. countries uh, count their elephants at different times. Um, but, and, and it's a mixed bag for elephants, to be honest. There is some encouraging uh, data which suggests that certainly in East Africa, for example, numbers are increasing, which is, which is fantastic. Um, but in parts of Central and Western Africa, we are still seeing um, declines in numbers, certainly concerning population figures there. And, and the, one of the biggest threats, well, no, there are lots of threats to, to elephants, uh, habitat fragmentation. And as I talked about in my presentation, the interplay of that with the impacts of climate change can be quite important. So, so we know that climate change is going to have impacts in terms of water, potentially habitat availability. And as those habitats get more fragmented, that becomes even more challenging. And then obviously, one of the other key threats for elephants is the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so elephants are poached for their ivory, so, um, uh, primarily driven by demand from uh, key Asian countries. And, and so a lot of work that WWF is doing is, is to tackle that threat. Um, and we work both in the sites where you find elephants um, mm -hmm. so that uh, we can improve the protection of the elephants there. And also we can involve local communities to make sure that they are benefiting from living with elephants and not unduly enduring the costs of living with elephants. And then also we work in some of the Asian countries to uh, reduce demand. So working with people that have traditionally used ivory to change some of their behavioural practices. I think that's just as important. You're not just, you're looking at the conservation of elephants not just as a biological issue or just an elephant issue it's more sort of worldwide it's societal uh, and it's really about bringing in community conservation programs as well and working with people just as much as working with animals absolutely yeah all right I'm just checking my figures and actually it's just over 400,000 not 300,000 so they're doing even better <laughs> that's amazing um <laughs> Uh, we do have another question coming in from YouTube and it's from Mohammed Kamran um, and he has asked, do birds get affected by climate change during their flight? I'm not a bird specialist, but certainly we are seeing impacts in terms of migration. And in Africa in particular, you know, there are lots of birds that have a migratory path mm -hmm. uh, either within Africa or, or to and from Africa. And, and what we see is either ends of those migratory change, if the habitats change significantly as a result of climate change, that's going to have an impact on um, on, on those species. And, and as I say, I'm not a bird expert, but I would imagine very much in the way that as we see for, for marine turtles, mm. uh, changes in sea temperature impacts their, um, their migratory routes through the sea because we're seeing changes in temperature there. That may well be a thing for, for migratory birds as well. Absolutely. Um, we've got another question coming in from YouTube and it is by Splish Splash. Um, and they've asked, how long does it take to move or relocate a turtle nest? It will really depend on the circumstances. Um, it can take several hours. Uh, as I say, it's done really, really carefully. Locating the nest in the first instance can be quite challenging. Um, so, <laughs> so sometimes we know that a, a female turtle is coming back to nest. Uh, as I say, they come back, you know, on a roughly annual, sometimes couple of year interval, and then we'll come back multiple times within that nesting season. So we sort of have a good idea-ish of when the turtle will be coming to the beach and so can almost be waiting for it, mm. obviously at a safe distance in a way that won't impact the nesting behaviour. But sometimes we're just relying on reports from local communities or fishermen who'll say, actually, I've seen some disturbance over there. And you can usually see quite distinctive patterns in the sand where a nesting site um, has happened. So then there's a, there can be a degree of having to search and just, you know, being on a boat going along the coast and looking to see if you can see that disturbance on the, on, 
on the shoreline. Um, so that in itself can be quite a lengthy process. And then the actual relocation, again, it depends really on how far you need to move it. Um, but I would think a, a couple of hours, a good couple of hours. Um, and when you were talking about those disturbances, is that obviously from uh, the turtles' flippers? Yes. Yeah. So you can see, uh, again, depending on what happened with the tide since the event, you can see uh, usually a pathway up the beach from the flipper marks. And then uh, once a turtle, a turtle digs the nest hole and sort of um, lays the eggs and then uses its flippers to push the sand back into uh, the nesting hole. So that okay. creates a sort of disturbance in the sand. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, we do have another comment or another question coming in from YouTube. And Mohammed has asked another question. What was your favorite animal to work with during your career? I think this is going to be a very hard question for you to answer, Kath. <laughs> it is quite a hard question. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, ha I do have a huge soft spot for mountain gorillas. Um, it's, it's a large part of my role right now. I've been very lucky to see mountain gorillas in, in all of the three countries where you find mountain gorillas. And they are a truly incredible species. You're, when you go see mountain gorillas, you, you visit a group that's habituated. So they're used to seeing people. Um, so you will trek for several hours through through the forest um, and then you get an hour it's very carefully managed mm. uh, to minimize the risks to mountain gorillas and then you have an hour where you spend at a safe distance but you, you spend that time with the mountain gorilla so you're not in a car like you might be when you go see lions or elephants or things like that you're literally in in the forest with them uh, and it is quite a, a magical experience I really I struggle to put it into words to do it justice um, it's it's truly incredible there is however one other species I would mention which I worked on at the beginning of my career which is something called an akarpi um, which not everyone will have heard of which comes in a very similar sort of part of the world to mountain gorillas mm -hmm. it's found in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and its closest relation is the giraffe it looks a little bit like a cross between a giraffe and a zebra. So it has it sort of shape wise looks like a giraffe, mm -hmm. a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. chocolate brown, and then it has stripy back legs um, yeah. and and a big blue tongue. Uh, it's, it's just a weird and wonderful species. Um, and when I when I was at uh, Bristol Zoo during my dissertation, the akapi were behind me. So I spent a lot of time with them, just sitting watching the gorillas with the akapi behind me. Um, and then at, when I was at Zoological Society of London, some of our work was camera trapping to find uh, evidence of there still being akapi mm -hmm. present in certain landscapes. And they're just, I, yeah, the fact that lots of people don't know what they are, and when you look at them, they look a little bit like they've been two animals squished together. Um, yeah, they're just fascinating. That's my favourite type of animal as well. Uh, <laughs> when, you, when you go, I'm not really sure if you're, you look like you're this and this crossed together. But Akapis, they've got the really big ears as well, don't they? Yeah. They have yeah. big ears. I know exactly what you're talking what you're talking about. I do also love them as well. Uh, we've got yet another question coming in. They're absolutely coming in now from YouTube. Um, and this is from Aiden, who is asking, how many turtles are there in the world? That is a really good question. And the answer is we don't know terribly well. Um, finding out stuff about marine turtles is really hard because certainly, <laughs> particularly for females, they spend so much of their life out at sea. Mm -hmm. um and and certainly for a really we know a little bit more these days but for a really long time we didn't know very much about what happens between a turtle when it hatches gets into the sea it sort of disappears for a few years and it's only when they get to maturity and come back and nest that we start understanding mm -hmm. things about what's happening in their their world again um and so we don't have reliable estimates for for turtles. Um, we have some populations where we know about the trends that are happening on those specific populations, mm -hmm. but in terms of global estimates, we don't we don't have those particularly reliably. What we do know is that um, almost all of the the species that we know about are on the IUCN list of uh, red list which is about the level of risk to extinction um, and the only one that isn't is not because we, we just don't have the data we don't know how they're doing so we can't really make an assessment of their conservation status so they are very threatened um, we are starting to learn more as i say about marine turtles and some really interesting work that we've been doing in kenya um, 
is to put satellite tags on turtles. So you might have read about camera trapping, I'm sorry, camera trapping, of sort of collars that they put on mm -hmm. terrestrial species mm -hmm. so that they can either radio track them or use GPS to track a species mm -hmm. and understand where it moves. So what we're starting to do now is, is do that for marine turtles as well. Um, and so we've used some different kinds of tags. We mm -hmm. use some really basic tags that were uh, like you get on a cow in their ear, so you just tag yep. them with a number so you mm -hmm. know when a turtle, when the same turtle comes back to a site, so you can get some information there. We've also used, as I say, satellite tags, so they get stuck on their shell, and then we're able to, when they come up to the surface, track their movement patterns so we understand where they are and where they're going. And then we've also just started to pilot the use of um, video camera tags. So these are tags that go on the turtle and then when they're under the water, um, they start filming. So you can see how a turtle's moving and what they're doing and how they're interacting with other species. Mm -hmm. So those things all together, they, they won't give us an easy answer about how many turtles there are in the world, but they will certainly start to build our understanding and, and enable us to say more about the sort of trends that are happening to turtle populations. And of course, uh, technology is evolving every year, every decade, and who knows what sort of innovative technologies will be invented, developed in the future to enable us to um, gather a more accurate estimation of how many turtles there are out there. Fantastic question, Aidan. I think we have another question coming in from YouTube. Um, and again, it's from Aidan. Um, it, it says, how many animals have you dealt with? Or I suppose, how many Gosh. animals have you worked with? I know, I know. It's going to be a big number, isn't it, Kath? <laughs> I'm trying to think, actually. Um, yeah, lots. Um, so, as I say, primarily with an East African focus. Uh, so, so mountain gorillas, marine turtles, um, baboons, chakma baboons, uh, a carpi, elephants, rhinos. Um, uh, a few antelope species. Um, when I worked at the uh, Zoological Society of London, it was a very species focused piece of work. And as I say, it was these species that are called edge species. So that means evolutionary distinct, globally endangered. So essentially they are the weird and wacky species. Um, and, and some of them are, right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, there are things like pangolins, which uh, I don't think it might be World Pangolin Day today, actually. I actually um, think might be. I think yeah. Happy World Pangolin Day. <laughs> Happy World Pangolin Day, which are these little scaly anteaters um, that you find in, in Africa and Asia. Um, mm. Again, not a huge amount known about them because they're they're very secretive um, and so it's quite hard. To, we don't have good population estimates for them either. Um, but then also some really weird and wacky species like something called an OLM, which is O-L-M, uh, which is... Um, a little sort of salamander that lives in caves in Eastern Europe uh, and a little bit like shark, it uses um, electrical sensing uh, to navigate the world. Um, a whole host of, I, I can't give you a number, I'm afraid, lots. I'm going to go with lots. <laughs> Well, you know I think that's a perfectly acceptable answer. I think once you start, when you've worked in conservation and have as much experience as you do, Kath, I think you kind of end up losing track of how many <laughs> different species of animals you work with, let alone how many individual animals that you work with. It just, it all kind of just accumulates. Um, do we have another question coming in from YouTube? We do. Uh, and it's from Splish Splash. And which animal is the most endangered in the world? Hmm, that's a good question. There are, certainly for primates, there's a list of like the top 15 most endangered species. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some of those that are things that we have recently found and realized that they are very, very endangered. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you what the most endangered in the world is. Um, and it's interesting, it, it sort of, there's lots of different ways in which we assess how endangered things are. So, so mountain gorillas, for example, there aren't that many mountain gorillas. So there's just over a thousand, according to the most recent estimates. But actually, mountain gorillas, they're, they're still a conservation dependent subspecies, mm -hmm. but they're they're kind of considered as a bit of a success story. Um, their, their numbers are believed to have been increasing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so on the IUCN red list that I mentioned, they're, they're now categorized as endangered, whereas previously they were categorized as critically endangered. And that's not to say there aren't threats to them, but it's just that, you know, things are kind of going in the right way. But actually, their numbers are still incredibly small um, mm. and they're very fragile. But because of the factors, we lose lots of different factors to work out how endangered a species is. Um, and so it can be quite complicated to identify the most endangered. Um, I mean, it's sad to say that a lot of species are endangered um, mm. for a whole variety of different reasons and climate change being a, a very real part of that. Um, and that's why it's really, you know, organisations like WWF are really important in terms of, of trying to minimise the impacts that we, we see on these species. Um, and unfortunately, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, what I wanted to quickly ask, I suppose, is one of our last questions is you've been talking a lot about mountain gorillas and they do share a lot of DNA between uh, humans and us. And I'm just wondering, mountain gorillas out in the wild, uh, has there been any reports of transmission of COVID-19 between humans and any sort of primate species in the wild? Yeah, it, it's definitely a concern. As you say, mountain gorillas in particular, we share about 98% of our DNA with them. Um, and the threat of COVID-19 transmission or the virus that causes COVID-19 in, in people is, is a very real one for, for mountain gorillas and for other great apes. Um, and there aren't to date any confirmed cases, um, but you might have seen in the news recently that there was a confirmed case with uh, the Western lowland gorillas in San Diego Zoo. Um, they tested positive for the, the virus that causes COVID-19. So we do know it is possible um, that the great apes could catch, um, catch the disease. And certainly we know from other experience with mountain gorillas that they are very susceptible to uh, human respiratory diseases. Um, we know they definitely can suffer from those. And, and mountain gorillas in particular are quite at risk because a lot of the groups that we know are, as I said, habituated to human presence. So they mm. are coming into contact with people and they live in a habitat that has a very hard, very close edge with intensely cultivated and, and densely populated human human inhabited land. So mm. there's lots of opportunities for human wildlife interaction. And that's obviously where this risk would come in. Um, so it's certainly something that we've been very carefully managing for. Um, mountain gorilla tourism stopped when mm. COVID first broke out. Um, and now as it's starting to come back, we're, we're redoubling efforts to make sure that it's done in a, in a way that minimizes the risk of disease transmission as much as possible. So, mm. so wearing masks, maintaining a distance at sort of 10 meter distance, um, limiting the number of people and the, the amount of time that they can spend with mountain gorillas. It's also really interesting to note that, yes, there is absolutely this very real and very scary risk of disease transmission, but there's also the impacts of the collapse of tourism. So obviously, as we all know, no one's traveling right now. Um, and lots of conservation work in, in East Africa um, and, and mountain gorillas in particular, really, really reliant on tourism as a source of income, um, both to fund conservation activities and also to make sure that there are benefits going to a local community so that they see the value in having these species living near them. Uh, and so actually, one of the biggest impacts that we may well see of COVID is, is the, you know, the impact that it has in socioeconomic terms um, because of the collapse of tourism. And so now we're working really hard to try and develop strategies that make people less reliant on tourism. Um, I think for mountain gorillas, there will always be an element of tourism. It's a really high-end tourism product and brings in a lot of income into those countries. Um, but, but we do need to diversify, certainly in, in that area and, and elsewhere in East Africa, so that we have ways to deliver benefits to communities and ways to ensure that conservation efforts can continue, even if there are future, future impacts on tourism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think uh, the current pandemic has really forced us to reevaluate how we do everything and especially with conservation because they do heavily rely on tourism. Uh, but unfortunately, that is us out of time for today. Uh, thank you so much, Kath, for joining us. 
for our live Q&A. They were some absolutely fantastic questions and some fantastic responses. I feel like I've learned so much about African species and climate change. Um, and it's just been really lovely to speak about animals for a morning. Um, <laughs> But also thank you to everyone that's been watching and has commented with questions. Uh, if you've got any further questions, uh, you can contact the Science Centre and we can pass them on to Kath. Uh, but apart from that, we do have um, a zoo tour with Edinburgh Zoo going to the Greater One Horned Rhinos coming up next. Um, I know it's going to be very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much and we hope you have a lovely day. Bye.